Hi, I'm Katie Sullivan. This here is FizzGig. She is being a bit uh, needy, so she wanted to be a part of this. Um, I am an actress, and I was asked to be a part of this master class series from Tina, and I was super excited to be able to kind of share some of my perspectives and some of my journey with, um, with you guys to see if Maybe you can learn something or maybe you can glean something for yourself. Um, I am actually from Tuscaloosa. So um, uh, I was born in Texas, but we shortly moved uh, to Tuscaloosa when I was really little. And um, some of my earliest memories um, and some of my most exciting memories as a kid was going to the Bama Theater when I was really tiny. Um, one of the earliest productions I ever remember was a children's theater production of um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And um, a girl who went to my school uh, was in the play. And I was maybe in third or fourth grade. And my brain exploded <laughs> because I was like, oh my gosh, like I know her. I, how, how does one get to be able to do this? How does one get to uh, be a part of this? Like, there's, got, there's nothing special about, like, there's nothing special about this. Like, I, but it was, seemed extraordinary and it seemed something that was like so distant. And um, it was at that point that I started to kind of bug my parents and ask my parents if I could um, go to some auditions. And, um, my my first sort of early early experiences were with children's theater um, because I was l literally a child <laughs> and I just was like uh, so excited to be able to be involved in any way whatsoever with theater um, and then shortly after kind of doing a couple plays with children's theater I I did I got involved with theater Tuscaloosa and um, and I did everything I wanted to I was s such a sponge I just wanted to be in the building like just experiencing what it was to be a part of that community um experience what it's experiencing what it was to be someone who got to uh perform sometimes but honestly if I wasn't cast in something I built sets or I uh, stage managed, I stage managed a bunch of times. Um, I helped build costumes very poorly. <laughs> that definitely did not, was not my strong suit. But um, it was a learning ground for me. It was where I fell in love with theater, was Theater Tuscaloosa and the Bama Theater um, way back in the day. But, and it was also where I was just like, uh, I, I found a community of people that didn't necessarily look at my differences as something that were <laughs> something to be uh, looked at negatively necessarily. Um, some of you might not know, uh, I am actually uh, a performer with a disability. So I was born without the lower halves of my legs and when I was one, I, I started pulling myself up and trying to stand and my parents got me a pair of prosthetic legs and I have spent my entire life being someone walking around on stilts. And um, that is all I have ever known. Um, and the people at Theater Tuscaloosa uh, opened a world to me that I didn't have access to before. And I, like I said, I just wanted to do anything to be inside that building, whether it was being a stage manager or, um, you know, using a screw gun or um, any of those things, or when I got to to perform. Um, some of my favorite memories from, um, from doing theater um, at Theater Tuscaloosa, uh, I mean, I think my favorite show that I was involved in there and still to this day is one of my favorite shows was Cabaret. Just phenomenal cast, fun people. I um, got to wear just the most amazingly beautiful glittery costumes and had my first solo in a show and it just felt so exciting and I just knew that that is 
how I wanted to to spend my life. That's what I wanted to do. And I mean, there were times <laughs> that I literally like, I didn't go to prom <laughs> because I was in a show. So like theater was my life and um, and a huge part of, of the beginning and birth of that was was my time at Theater Tuscaloosa. When I graduated, um, from, I went to Central High School. When I graduated from Central, I um, actually went away to, to school. I went to St. Louis, Missouri, and I got my degree in acting from Webster University. Um, there's a conservatory at the school, and um, I, it was just kind of this perfect transition to be able to <laughs> leave a relatively small town, not go to a town that was like New York or LA or some crazy place. St. Louis was a really good middle ground for me to sort of get used to living in a bigger place and, and get my bearings and those kinds of things. Um, I got my, uh, my degree in acting and um, I shortly after that moved to Chicago. Um, and it, and what I will say about um, what I learned in the beginning of my career was um, my time in Chicago almost most most almost more than anything else was the idea of um, and the importance of networking. Now I don't mean that in some sort of like sleazy way or gross way, but there is something to having connections with people, maintaining good relationships with people, staying in touch with people. Um, and it was also the place where I, I learned so much about the audition process. And um, one of the most valuable things I've ever learned in my life was um, that casting directors uh, can be your biggest champions. Um, it was actually, I was, I was doing summer stock. I got into a, a, the, a summer theater right after college. And I was working with um, a director named Chuck Smith, who was at the Goodman. He was a resident director. And he invited me to come to Chicago to assistant direct to play, which I did. And it was at that point that then I met some other people at the Goodman and they asked me to be the casting intern. And that casting internship was one of the most valuable experiences I've ever had as a, as a young actor, was sitting on the other side of the table. So it's not always, you know, showing up, the, you know, the flowers start flying and you become this diva all the, all the way, right immediately the learning process of watching other people audition was invaluable to me. And also seeing what happens in the room before and after can be so educational because as an actor, you're terrified, you know, you can be terrified when you walk in, you're super nervous. And then when you leave, you immediately assume they're like, oh, well, she was terrible, or well, that was bad, or whatever it is that, it, that you say in your own mind. Um, and what really happens is they get excited. When somebody, they want for you <laughs> to show up and knock their socks off. They want for you to show up and just make their job easier by uh, being brilliant or being fantastic or uh, I always look at it now and since from that point on in my life I always look like at look at auditioning as I could be the answer to their problem they have a problem they have to cast the show they have to cast you know this episode of television or they have to cast this film and I am a possibility for them to to answer that problem so um that was invaluable early, early on um, when I was kind of just figure making my way as an, as early as an actor. Um, I only stayed in Chicago for a couple years. Uh, Chicago was never really kind of where I saw myself. I didn't want to be there forever. Um, but I did some great theater there, did some amazing work. 
Um, and then I moved to California. I moved to Los Angeles. And um, Los Angeles is, is a challenging place. It is a tough place. And breaking into television and and getting represent representation from uh, an agent that represents you for television can be kind of tricky and there was also the idea of like how do you become a member of sag like how do you do those things and there are a bunch of different routes that can be super helpful um and one of them and one of the easiest ways to sort of get looped into that whole world is um getting a commercial agent because they take on many more people. They, um, they have, uh, their rosters are a lot deeper. Um, you can get experience, you can um, make some money, um, but you can also, it's easier to sort of uh, end up getting in the union. There's also doing extra work, which is a, um, a fascinating way to start to sort of be on sets and learn some things. Um, it is not the most exciting work in the world, um, and there is definitely moments where you feel like a human set piece, um, and you're like, I went to school for this, <laughs> like, like I'm just walking from one side of the room to the other. Um, but if you can pay attention, you can learn something about how crews work together, how they move together, how uh, how to be someone who is... Um, helpful on a set and not somebody who when you you know get that big job or you show up and you get to be um, the one in the spotlight if you can do some of that observation and watch a little bit it can be really uh, really educational in a way where you don't have to be the one that like falls on your face because if you can just watch and observe um, it can be really helpful so I lived in LA for for a really long time um, and uh, at some point, um, there was some dry spells. I mean, it was, I had super exciting moments where I'd like book a pilot for NBC or I did uh, My Name is Earl or I, you know, would book TV shows. And then I would kind of go on these like as a performer with a disability and being somebody who is not a cookie cutter and I don't necessarily look like everyone else or what people are necessarily completely looking for all the time um i had some really frustrating dry spells in my early career um and it was kind of around that time that i started to look for other things to not only occupy my time but to feel like i was being becoming a more well-rounded person that i i couldn't just sit there and talk about the industry and that's all I could talk about because I don't think those people are interesting people and I'd rather be able to have a conversation with somebody who has lots of interests and they want they you know want to engage in all sorts of different conversations not just about you know what audition did you go on last week um and it was it was around that time that my prosthetist who makes my prosthetic legs offered me um a pair of running legs so the the blades they sort of look like um the letter they're kind of like skis like they're the letter j and um this whole new world opened up for me and i started to uh compete and practice and train and go to track events athletic events um i had no absolutely no uh, idea in my mind of where I could end up or what it could mean long term for me. And I definitely never in a million years would have said, oh, I'm going to end up at the Olympics or the Paralympics. Like that is, that it was not a thing. Um, it And early on, the idea of even just saying the word athlete was not something that was easy for me to do. I didn't feel like an athlete. You know, I grew up sort of in this collaborative space and this um, this group of people and this community of people that like we co you all become successful as a as a team as a group and doing something solo was really intimidating and scary for me. And so early on, I really sort of 
I feel like I approached becoming an athlete um, like an actress. All I knew how to do, all I knew how to do at this point in my life was to act as if. So like I started kind of looking at it as, okay, so if I'm an athlete, an athlete would probably wake up at four o'clock and go to the gym or an athlete would probably eat this food because it, you know, will fuel your body in a different way. And I slowly started to look at being an athlete like I was almost playing a role. And eventually that kind of you fake it till you make it, I guess, because, um, and also sort of discovering that I do had, I did have some really raw, uh, undiscovered athletic ability that I knew nothing about um, growing up without legs, finding out when you're 25 that you are a really fantastic runner (laughs) and you end up placing it in first or second in the world in something or you represent the United States uh, was, again, not something that I ever expected to do. Um, and it was obviously one of the most incredible and, and biggest honors of my life was representing the United States in the London um, 2012 Olympics. One of the things that I think is most important about what I learned from being an athlete is pushing yourself outside of comfort zones, um, taking risks, but also, again, doing something that has nothing to do with your time as an actor Um, because at the end of the day, you are a more interesting person. You're a well, more well-rounded person. You can have conversations about tons of topics and not have to, you know, feel like you're pigeonholed into this. And I think one of the things that make actors, um, interesting to me is that you're sort of weeding through that, that the human experience. And if you're not someone who goes out and gets, a variety of different human experiences. You don't have anything to call on. Um, You don't have life experiences to sort of mine in your own life. Um, And that's, I have this whole chapter and this whole world and this whole experience with with people that that I have been able to kind of put put in my backpack and bring with me um, onto a set or creating a character. So I've had a number of theater experiences, um, continuing to have a number of theater experiences. Uh, I, it, like I said about networking earlier, um, it was when I was living in L.A. for a while that Chuck Smith, who um, at the Goodman, um, contacted me and said, uh, there's, I think there's a, a role for you, you know, to audition for in this production. And um if I hadn't maintained a good relationship with the people at the Goodman, if I hadn't maintained um, my contact with them, even if it is once a year just to say hi, or, I mean, goodness, social media now, it's so easy to just poke somebody or say happy birthday or something to stay stay in contact with people. Um, I may not have had the opportunity to audition for uh, this play. It was called The Long Red Road. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of this huge shift in my, in my acting career. Um, it was directed by Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, and uh, Tom Hardy played my husband. The play was actually written for him. Um, and she was such a challenging character who had had so much tragedy and loss in her life. And... That exercise for me, what where it became challenging was showing up at the beginning of that roller coaster every night and going, okay, here we go. Like, you know, being able to face uh, doing, playing Sandra every night from beginning to end, um, it's, it, it was challenging in a way that was just uh, incredibly fulfilling creatively, but also insanely challenging. And the things I feel like I learned from Philip Seymour Hoffman at the end of the day that I still take with me are um, a couple of things. One, 
the work is never done, especially in theater. I mean, television and film, it's different. You sort of get your chances to, to give it a shot and then they say, okay, we got it, we're moving on. And then you never get to do it, you know, that scene's over and it's in the past. But theater is a living, breathing organism that you uh, every night get to like put your, your hand on and breathe your life into. And you should be learning something new or noticing something new or having a new experience even the night you close. That is what I learned from Phil. That the work is never done. And if you feel like you checked that box off and you got it right, then you've stopped mining those moments in the play for specificity and mining those moments about, you know, really being in those characters' thoughts and really having an experience where you are deeply listening to your partner. Um, the, you know, it's impossible. We're not robots. We can't do it every minute of every second of every play. But those moments that you get are that are true listening and true focus and true um, fighting for what you want. What is your action and what is your want in this scene? Um, that's the stuff. And and they're and they're crystals. Like they're just so tiny. And as soon as you notice that you had one, they're gone because then you're in your head again and you can't um, you can't get them back. Um, but I feel like that's that's what I learned from Phil is is chasing that those moments of specificity, and um, and 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 appreciating them. Shortly after, uh, fin you know, doing that, I I back and forth to LA, done a but did a bunch of TV in LA, um, and then uh, got sent uh, a number of years ago. I got sent a play called Cost of Living, which was at a workshop phase at that point. And cost of living has really, in a number of ways, completely changed my life. And it's interesting because the first time I read the script, the first time I read the play, I knew two things. <laughs> One, that it scared the crap out of me, the vulnerability of this character, the danger of this character, um, and the specificity of this character. And two, that I wanted to do everything in the world I could to get this job. Um, and I auditioned and I read and then I ended up actually, um, I did not get cast um, even after doing the first round of auditions and callbacks. I got cast in the workshop. They wouldn't, they hadn't decided to, to go with me for the, um, for the actual production. Um, and I found out later that it was a question of like age, you know, she's, this character was older than me and I, they weren't certain that that was something that I could handle or, um, and, uh, it's so interesting when you find out later these moments where you feel like you are like, you know, hanging by this thread of like. Am I going to get something? Is it going to go away? Um, and then when you actually find out what the thought process was on the other side, it wasn't, she's not a good enough actor. Or she's not, um, she, we don't think she can handle this. They were like, does she look a little young? <laughs> so like, you never really know. Um, and sometimes you'll never know. Sometimes you'll never find out what it was that either they went with someone else or um, they might have thought you were perfect or that you will be perfect in 10 years <laughs> to play that role. So um, it's not always the little voice in your, your head. It's not always that you're terrible at your job. Often it's not anything to do with that. But I ended up getting to do Cost of Living in the world premiere um, at Williamstown Theater Festival. We moved off Broadway in 2018 and I so got to be off Broadway with this show and create this character and and move on in that way and after that the uh the play Cost of Living won the Pulitzer Prize for drama the play itself had kind of took on a life of its own in a lot of ways um I've done the play now um 
in Williamstown in New York. I did a production in Los Angeles. And then I got to go to London. And um, I did the, the play in London. Um, and uh, I don't think my, my time as Ani is done. I certainly hope not. I, 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 I think, uh, I think I, I think I'm going to get to, to, to do that play again before it's all said and done. Um, but it's just an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of work and being in a position to originate a character and take them all the way to off Broadway and, and beyond to, you know, London and, um, it's extraordinary. It's, um, uh, and it's also, there's a level of, um, responsibility that you have to, to the, to the character and to, um, that idea of continuously breathing new life into it. I mean, there is a huge challenge to playing a character 170 times, do, you know, starting the play again for the, you know, and there are people who are, I mean, that's nothing compared to people who get on national tours of, you know, whatever it is, um, some huge musical and they're doing it nine times a week and you're just sort of on this forever cycle of, of that. It's, it's, being able to find those moments that are um, specific and fresh and new, even the 170th time you hear the music start, you know, like you hear the lights go, you feel the lights go down and you go, okay, um, here we go. So how do, I, how do I book work on television and film? Um, there's... Uh, really the best, I mean, the really kind of the only real way to do it is, is to get representation and to have an agent that will represent you and send you out. There are ways to submit yourself for things, but after you get, after you get past a certain threshold of, um, of, uh, a point in your career, um, you, you, your job is to show up and, portray that person and do the best you can in that moment, in that scene. And uh, it shouldn't be your job to shake down <laughs> auditions or chase down opportunities to audition. Um, is that still sometimes, does things like that still sometimes happen? Sure. When you find out about something that you were like, oh my gosh, did you, you know, you send it to your agent or your manager and you say, I, I, I want to, read for this like they don't know this yet but this is I'm who they want um sure that still happens but um but it really is having a good agent that understands you understands what it is your goals are and um finding somebody that can help you reach those goals and and, and achieve what you want you want to uh what advice would I give to an actor when transitioning from live theater to television and film they are two completely different animals. Um, theater is, le you know, this, like I said, a living, breathing, um, collaborative uh, event that happens. And, and working on a film set or a television set um, is a different muscle. Um, everything from scale to scale, like... If I'm standing on a stage in a theater that seats 1,500 people, I'm going to present myself in a way in my posture, in my voice, in how I uh, project and all of those things uh, in, a, in a bigger way. And if I'm shooting a television scene uh, where I'm whispering, <laughs> you can actually whisper. And, uh, that is the, uh, scale is a big thing when you're starting to try transition from television, from theater to, to television, just the idea of like how much it can capture in just a movement of your eye instead of having to do some huge physical gesture to make, to get something across to the back row, um, and that is something that is not easy necessarily to 
to learn. Um, but I will tell you what, we have the ability these days to, uh, we have them it in our pockets. We have cameras. So, um, you know, there are ways of practicing. Shoot scenes with your friends. Uh, take scenes from films or TV shows that you like and recreate them. Uh, try to understand how the different, notice uh, the different shots uh, in a TV show and how the camera, how close the camera is, how far away the camera is. Um, and the idea of having to do a scene over and over and over again and have the idea of like matching, um, for example, my you know, my bangs, if my bangs, if I had started the scene out with my bangs like this and halfway through the scene, I put them behind my ear, um, I've completely ruined the continuity of the scene and then the editor is going to have a disastrous time trying to cut that scene together. So there's, there are skills and things in learning um, the, the kinds of things that you have to do when you're working on on a television set that you never even have to begin to think about and you shouldn't think about um, when you're on stage doing theater. The process of um, bringing a character to life for me is, um, it all starts with the, the script and um, hopefully most of the time it's a script that you're excited about and you, you're excited to sort of mine who this character is and, and figure out how to bring them to life. Um, but for me, it's, I, I love mining for clues. And the, the little things that one person says about somebody else um, or, you know, the, those ideas of, of what does the character say? Is it true or is it false? Um, what does the character do? Um, and uh, what other people say about them, and are those things true or false? And just sort of figuring out, those are my kind of beginning places of putting tiny little bricks into place of who this person is. Um, and then you just get to sort of use your imagination and shade in all the, all the places where there's, there's empty holes. And you can decide if you want it to be purple or yellow or orange and... Um, the difference between really bringing a character to life on stage versus in television, um, one of the things, honestly, stage, you have so much more time and it's a luxury to be able to work with a director, figure out how, how to bring that character to life and um, have deep conversations about one sentence, <laughs> which is definitely not something that you get the time to do during uh, shooting a television show. Um, so for, for TV or film, you really have to sort of do as much as you can, and it's such a shorter amount of time that I, I feel like with television, you, it's easier to bring more of yourself forward unless you are doing some you know, crazy dialect or some outlandish character where you really get to kind of push further away but where you find the truth in television since you don't have time to slowly put layers and layers on of a, a character is bringing sort of more of who you are forward and having the character come closer to meet you instead of vice versa if that makes sense um, especially just in the amount of time television time is money and we got to go we got to get the shot and move on I am a producer now and I have been developing some projects and we've been working really hard. It is a cool process. It is a exciting process. It is a heartbreaking process in the same way that, you know, just showing up to an audition and, and saying, okay, I either get it or, or I don't. It's a whole different thing to be the person saying, I have dreamt this thing up and I want to try to bring it to life. Um, and that is a challenge uh, on a magnitude that I wasn't necessarily <laughs> expecting uh, to have, but, um, but there is a confidence in those kinds of things. And there is also, um, we live in a world where I think performers have to wear a number of hats and you definitely have to um, stick yourself out into, into situations where you're less comfortable or you have to put on a, a totally different role than you were expecting. 
Um, but I will say, going into pitch meetings with executives and things at networks and, and that sort of business, um, I, I will tell you what, the fact that I have spent my entire life auditioning makes that feel like absolutely nothing. Oh, I have to go into this room and be myself for 20 minutes, half an hour? That's fine. <laughs> to, um, you know, I feel like I feel like performers uh, are sort of spent their spent their lives preparing. I've spent my life preparing to be able to do that. So, what inspires me? I think it is seeing people push past um, what is perceived as possible. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean actors or, or people in the, in the entertainment industry. Um, I really mean uh, people in, in any sort of situation or any sort of um, industry. If there are assumptions about who you are and what, what people think is possible, um, I love nothing more than to hear stories about people saying, yeah, oh yeah. Okay, watch me, you know, that sort of whole idea of just like, here, hold my, hold my beer, <laughs> like, you know, and then proving it to people. Um, and does that mean you're always successful? Does it mean sometimes you fall completely flat on your face and you have to, um, you know, be, be a person who uh, figures out how to pick thing, pieces up after everything has fallen apart? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, and I have to say the times I've learned the most in my life definitely are moments of failure and defeat um, and sort of licking your wounds and taking a moment and going back and saying, okay, what can I learn from this? How can I do that better? Um, thank you so much for including me in this and, um, and you know, hopefully, again, that any bit of, of my life experience or my uh, trials and tribulations and failings and, and successes, you know, uh, can be a source of, of inspiration or a source of, of knowledge or learning. Um, that's awesome. So um, for me, Katie Sullivan and Little Myth Fizz Gig, thanks for having us. Bye. Say bye.